This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, good afternoon. I'm a Southerner. I love that kind of feedback, that call and response. At least I thought that's what we did. It's really nice to be here um, and to talk to you about this work from uh, my, my latest research monograph, Stubborn Roots, Race, Culture, and Inequality in U.S. and South African Schools. I'm going to do as much as possible to try to uh, minimize the jargon, but I'm assuming that there are a number of sociologists in the room. Can I just get a sense of those of you who are social scientists in the room, for, first of all? Okay. And education? How many folks in education? Okay, so I, I definitely know who my audience is. I want to start with this quote from a group of African-American boys um, who attend, or at that time attended, a very affluent socially diverse high school in a city I call North Capital City. I use pseudonyms throughout this talk. And this is really gets at the crux of the argument that I want to suggest and, and the findings that I will share with you today. And I want to start with Judah, who, I, who was a very civically engaged young man who sat on the mayor's youth council. All of these boys come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, and they had been part of, the, of a program that had been busing um, uh, racial and socioeconomic minority students into um, a very affluent suburb for many years, for over four decades, actually, as a part of integrating, but dare I say, desegregating their school. And I will refer to that program as the VDP, the Voluntary Desegregation Program. That's a pseudonym as well. But I want to start because this really gets at the gist of what I'm trying to argue uh, in this new work. And, and Judah Art says, the system doesn't encourage us to interact. Think about it. Jarvis says, why should we interact? Jonathan, yeah, why? Marcus, why do we need to be encouraged? Thinking about his own agency. Judah, because the VDP program is not just about coming out to suburban schools during the homework and going back to our homes. The VDP program is about teaching suburban schools, suburban students, what it's like to live in the inner city, what it feels like to be a person of color. It's about, he gets cut off, Jarvis. I thought that the purpose of a VDP was to come out and get a good education. Marcus, yeah, Jonathan, yeah, Judah, no, it's not. That's his main purpose, but the other purpose is to teach each other what we have to offer. Judah then continues. I'm referring to like the intangibles, not whether or not you can reiterate the facts that the teachers are teaching you, not whether you can memorize like a math equation or a scientific formula. I'm talking about character, strength and integrity and how we relate to other people, how we identify with other people in our creativity. Those are things I feel are not being valued enough in the school system. I think that it's important to have those attributes if you want to make it far in life. But with the way the system is structured now, they solely focus on, you know, what grades you get. And I think that just doesn't do us much justice. End of quote. That's a lot from a 15-year-old. It's very savvy, very sage. But dare I say that this debate among these boys what actually mirrors an age-old debate that actually began in, the middle, began in the middle part of the 20th century when even sociologists and philosophers and economists and psychologists were debating the race problem vis-a-vis -vis the issue of whether or not we should integrate schooling. W.E.D. Du Bois, Hortense Powdermaker, Charles Thompson, many of them were debating. What is the purpose of this? What is the function? Will we actually get the ends through this means of bringing people together that we want to get through these kinds of formations, through the demographic changes in schools? And then, would our children re be really fully educated, not just in terms of the development of their human capital development, but also in terms of their civic involvement, their fuller incorporation into a democracy that we call the United States. In this book, I argue that there are three tensions to going on in educational research today, drawing on the work of David Lavery, who is also my colleague at Stanford, thinking about how we think about education, and particularly what I want to draw your attention to 
is how we don't think about what I call the soft structures of schooling that can unintentionally and unwittingly reproduce the kinds of social and educational inequities that we have playing out in our society. Lavery talks about three mindsets that we generally take, and I would suggest that most of the research that we see in the sociology of education today fall in the first two. One is that we focus on the social efficiency argument. Schools, their purpose being cultivating human capital and preparing workers. We're as a society about preparing workers. The second one is the one where we all think of ourselves as, as, as schooling for a private good, preparing ourselves to compete making choices so that we can be mobile, do better than our parents or our foreparents perhaps. But in the process of the way those have unfolded in schools and society, we can very well undermine, Lavery says, the third one, which is the democratic equality approach. Schools for developing citizens, that's the tension that Judah and Jarvis and all of them were getting into. How is it that the things that go on behind the walls in our schools as they play out through the prisms of race and class and gender relations either facilitate the processes for all to be mobile or actually impede those processes and also challenge the kind of democratic processes that we say in a, that we espouse, the values that we espouse in American society. So I argue in this work particularly as we move forward, that we have to think about the dual structures in schooling. A lot of our fixation has been on improving the opportunities context, the resource context, having very, we talked at length about that last night, having very high teacher quality in schools, the academic rigor and high expectations for all, school finance equity, having great physical plant and technology and resources. But as a cultural sociologist, I also think that we have to think about this, this thing, something that we ignore the more an intangible, as Judah would say, the cultural schema that are embedded within schools through the rules, the codes, the ideological underpinnings, and the substance of the relationships that are formed. Sociologists like to study people and their relationships, various actors. And I suggest, drawing on the work of many, that the schema within schools has an underlying logic of its own, as Sharon Hayes would argue, that culture is structure too. The organizational culture of schooling has structure. And others like Diane Ray and Aaron Horvath and Anthony Antonio and Patricia McDonough have talked about the habitus of a school, the ethos, the environment, the kinds of things that can actually facilitate bringing some groups into the center and keeping other groups on the margins of schooling. And I'm adding in this work, not just thinking about the class dynamics of schooling, but thinking about the, also the racialized dimensions of schooling, the intangible processes, and some of them actually are quite concrete processes that can facilitate the marginalization of different groups of school students, even when they're in resource-rich context, even when you have the strong material context. And how these, pro these dynamics play out can cultivate what Pierre Bourdieu calls symbolic violence on the lives of many of these youth. And it is important for us to kind of think about what these processes are, because if we want to understand, I suggest, why it is that some groups do well, or why is it that the project of integration didn't work necessarily, or dare I say desegregation because they're not the same, and I'll talk more about that, then we have to go inside and examine those softer structures, which I argue are associated with the cultural schema within schools. And then and one way that I do this is to think about the boundaries that are existent within our educational spaces today. Michelle Lamont at Harvard and her associates have talked about social and symbolic boundaries. So social boundaries being the classifications that we use all the time to signify who the us versus the them are. And the symbolic boundaries are the actual tools we use in our day-to-day -day practices to help to, to actually uh, to play those roles out every day, the us versus the them. Thank you. He's trying to get me. Let me just stop for a second. work. And so what I suggest in this work in Stubborn Roots is I've talked about how some practices within school can facilitate that boundary maintenance through 
um, various practices through things like ability grouping, drawing on the work of many like more recently Carolyn Tyson, but also through ideological orientations. I'm going to draw on the work of a South African scholar named Linda Chisholm through policy codes, through actual specific ethno-racial uh, practices and codes in the South African process I'll talk about. And then, so that's at the school level, at the organizational level. But I also want to understand how we as agents how students, how teachers, how educators can maintain those boundaries through their specific taste and preferences and their misunderstandings of each other. And I, I do this in this work by drawing on a notion on something that I've been trying to develop in my, my own thinking. In my first uh, research, uh, uh, book, um, based on my research from the early and late 1990s, I argued that in order for us all to figure out educators and parents and communities to figure out how to more deeply engage various groups who have been historically disadvantaged in education, um, that we had to figure out how to minimize the boundaries that separate these kids. And that all of us had to figure out how to subscribe to what I call multicultural navigation so that we don't end up belittling whether it's either intentionally or unintentionally the actual cultural repertoires that kids of various social backgrounds bring in. Because that was one of the, the what I found was one of the biggest challenges for the kids to whom I spoke in, in that year. And so I've been arguing about why it's necessary for educators as well as kids to be multicultural navigators. And meaning what I mean is subscribing to different kinds of taste cultures and, 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 and different ways of being and moving more seamlessly across social lines. And I was, I've been very greatly influenced by the work of Eviatar Zerubbabel, who argues about the value of a flexible mind, cognitively, right? As opposed to the flexible mind being able to allow us to see how different groups of people can go coexist, to see how there may be intersections among various ways of being and understandings in our society. And Eviatar, he says that our society and our schools could progress when we have more flexible minds in our society as opposed to being more cognitively rigid in our orientations. When you're rigid, you keep others out. Those boundaries of the us and the them, they stay, they're so thick. Or even fuzzy-minded. But Zerubbabel says, it's not the necessary, we don't also, we, we also need some structures in society. We also need, and there's nothing inherently wrong with some of the kinds of classifications we have. It's when those classifications become tied to resources that are not very well distributed and render some people uh, having access to the things that lend themselves to mobility and better well-being in society and others are not. So it's not so much that, that we don't need the different kinds of classifications, it's what happens when we become too rigid in those classifications so that it renders the kinds of inequities that we see play out economically, politically, socially, and academically. And so I argue in this work from a theoretical stance that we need to think about how to make schools more culturally flexible as well as individuals. And that will facilitate the propensity of students to move across different academic spaces, across different social spaces, across different cultural spaces. It also will facilitate that for educators because this is not an asymmetric process. It is something that we all need to do in order to improve the entire realm of schooling for all groups of students, I suggest. So I'm just going to show you this in a picture. I, this we have quite a bit of research on in the field in terms of thinking about why we need the material inputs. But I'm going to focus more on this part, the sociocultural. I don't know why that's in black, sorry. But that the response, the actual relationship of the sociocultural to these outcomes of cultural flexibility at the student level, how does it associate with student selection of academic, extracurricular, activities, their social engagement with other people who are different like them, and also what is the association of that context with the kinds of codes and practices, whether they're implicit or explicit, that actually play out in schools. And so here is the question that I, I really want to focus on today. What are some of those factors that can inhibit or facilitate students' ability to move across different boundaries and to be culturally flexible in schools? And you can add a corollary too. What are some of those practices, although this is another study, that actually could facilitate educators' ability to be more culturally flexible? And I will talk about the implications of that later. <laughs> 
So let me tell you about the case studies. This work, my ideas and arguments are based on a study that I've, I conducted from 2004 to 2008. And I started thinking comparatively. And I started thinking comparatively because in 2001, I went to South Africa for the first time with a group of colleagues from the University of Michigan. And I was sitting out one day on a very sunny, uh, at that time it was like fall for them, fall day in August, with a, a mixed race group of kids who were the first group of kids, some of the first kids who were benefiting from the change of schools in the new South Africa, the democratic South Africa. And I'm talking to a boy whom I call Sipo. And I say to Sipo, what is it like for you, Sipo, to move from the township, to come from the township every day to this new school, an X Model C school, which under the apartheid regime had been all white. But in the post-apartheid era, it had rapidly desegregated. And the middle classes, black and brown and lower middle classes, were moving into these schools. And he said to me, ma'am, well, you know, the kids back in the township, they think, quote, we're acting white. And he said, and when we come here, we don't necessarily, well, you know, we all get along, but it's just like going back and forth, going back and forth. And one of the things why that actually struck me is because I had just finished keeping it real. I thought I was done with thinking about this, quote, acting white issue as, it exp as we've used it to um, explain the uh, achievement gaps in the United States. And here I was 9,000 miles away and hearing it again in another context. And I thought this would be fascinating to try to understand movement and opening up societies in two different countries whose co racial and social compositions are the converse the, uh, uh, of each other. So in South Africa, they, there are similarities in origins. In South Africa, we know that there was subordination through conquest of indigenous groups, the San and the Khoi Khoi, very similar to in the US with the Native Americans. Um, in this country, there, in, in South Africa, like here, there was imported slavery. There were racial formations that existed in these two societies. And in the 20th century, we had apartheid. And in the US, we had Jim Crow, de jure segregation. And over time, these two systems actually have been compared by political scientists and historians. But what's really interesting are the differences in the power bases in those societies. And here you have, while, while economically, we know who are in the dominant positions in both society, politically, we have very different uh, things going on. And so I wanted to understand how schools that are grappling with the question of diversity, and particularly the movement of kids from historically disadvantaged communities, would, would, would fare similarly or differently. And I also wanted to understand if it would play out differently because in South Africa, they were thinking more about schools going back to library for societal development and transformation. Thinking about radical inclusion, there are 11 national languages in that country. In the U.S., comparatively in the U.S., we think about the role of schools for global and individual competitiveness. In South Africa, there is the movement to move away from racial discourse, to actually more fundamentally incorporate and bring to the center all of its people. In this country, racial and class discourse are so salient about how we think about achievement. In South Africa, there is no tracking because of the process of trying to create equity fully in schools. In 2008, they actually eradicated a form of tracking. When I first started, they had it. Here, we know that tracking is a very big fundamental part of the organizational structure of schooling. In South Africa, there's a standardized national curriculum. We're moving towards the common core standards here, of course, but we, at the moment, during this research, and we don't know what's gonna happen with that, we were dealing with the NCLB testing ethos and the differentiated curriculum and individual state tests. So given these two very different policy contexts in two countries that were both hyper-racialized, which had a massive impact on the class structures of these societies, how might things look similarly or differently? That's what I wanted to do. So I decided to go ahead and design a study and do that. And so this is based on a, a case study of eight schools, what I will tell you about, in four cities. Two of the cities, one city in each country, are located in where, regions where the racial relations are more black-white oriented, the binary, the traditional binary. 
And two other cities in both countries are more heterogeneous and multiracial, multi-ethnic. They're, mu they're in-between groups, if you will. In the U.S., Latino and Asian students. In South Africa, more the colored population, right? In each school, in each city, I also chose a school that was majority minority and multiracial and one that was multiracial and majority white. I want to say to you, for this study, I chose schools that were all relatively high performing for their local context. I was trying to control as much as possible that kind of variation to really get at that cultural schema that I was talking about. And we performed all kinds of work. I went back to high school for a year. In both countries, I went back to high school for six months and, uh, in South Africa, and I went back to high school several years later in, for six months in the U.S. with a team of graduate students. And so we had all kinds of data. In fact, we were swimming in data. Um, and we also randomly surveyed a, a, a stratified sample of students within each school for a total of about 1,561 students. So there's a lot of data here to compare these schools, and this took, it took me a long time to kind of comb through this data, my research team and I, to try to uh, tell a story. And so now I'm going to try to get into the story, but, but let me just first tell you, show you the demographics. I'm going to, I'm going to, I will rely on your, no, your, rely on code words in some ways to help you remember these eight schools. If it has city in the title, then you can think about it as an urban public school. North City Tech is a majority minority school. It's a high performing multi-ethnic school in North Capital City. If it has village or prep in it, prep in it, it's a suburban school rather. So North Village Prep is the sister comparative school about 20 miles up the road, down the road from North City Tech. You can see it's a predominantly white school. This is where Judah and Jarvis and all of his peers, their peers went to school. South City Honors, is a high-performing African-American school in South Capital City. It has a small um, white uh, population, but is considered one of the top-performing high schools in this city. It's 15 miles down the road from South County Prep, which has about three-quarter white students and about, oh, I'm sorry, about three-quarter white, uh, yeah, three-quarters white students and about a fifth um, of African-American students. Comparatively in the study, I drew four South African schools. And under South African, uh, uh, in the South African, uh, uh, in South Africa, the schools that are now more um, integrated, if you will, or let's say desegregated, are Palmer and Williston. They were formerly all white schools. They are now significantly black and brown, with black and colored students and a critical mass of white students. Whites only comprise about 9% of the national population in South Africa, you can see that they are, they, are, they are really well represented in these schools. And most of the teachers in these schools are also of white backgrounds. Groveland is a color dominant school. And in South Africa, I need to just tell you this as the background, no, no two racial groups could actually go to school with each other. Coloreds had to be separated from Africans who had to be separated from whites who had to be separated from Asians. So we had four different racial classifications in this country and 19 different departments of education for each province based on the racial groups represented. That's just apartheid, separate. That's just how separate it was for these groups. So it was a big deal for even Groveland to be desegregated by the closest students in the South African population. And then there's Mont Johnny High School, which was considered the X model C of the township, which is mostly a colored or African student. Just a few background details about school desegregation in South Africa. What makes it also a striking comparison is that in South Africa, school desegregated schools are considered the better public schools, and there are also more schools that are more accessible to the lower middle class and the middle class, because students have to pay a fee to go to school. So the way you keep stratification in South Africa is by charging higher fees. Um, and so those families that are more resourced can cross neighborhood boundaries and they can go into these schools. Okay, that's just a little bit of background, maybe more than you needed to hear, but hopefully just to, to get at any of those questions in the back of your minds. So what I first want to do is to show you some data from my survey, because this is really what's going to help me get into the meat of my ethnographic and interview data. We wanted to understand in this study the actual, the degree to which students reported their cultural flexibility. 
And I created a nine item scale. So a high score on this scale means higher cultural flexibility and a low scale means low cultural flexibility. And drawing from the literature, I wanted to understand the extent to which self-esteem, participation in certain kinds of courses, whether they were regular or honors courses, uh, the number of extracurricular activities, because the, the research shows if we listen to people like Bowles and Gentis and others, that the curriculum would shift. And depending on the kind of latitude you have pedagogically or to learn, that could lend itself to your becoming more flexible in your ideas, your thinking, even the extracurricular activities. So these were things that I hypothesized could matter. I also wanted to know if there were changes, uh, differences between the different school types. And of course, race was another thing. I also sampled students and uh, surveyed students and asked them about their preferences, about whom they wanted to, with whom they wanted to go to school or live. And so the question was, the questions were, I prefer, it was, a, it was a, 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 a true false question about whether students prefer to go to schools with kids who had the same socioeconomic background or the racial ethnic background. We control for, um, so those attitudes, for GPA, gender, and region. I'm just going to tell you what the findings are without the, without the coefficients. You can get the papers or the book or whatever if you are really interested in that. But here are the main findings. We found that white students reported marginally higher levels of cultural flexibility than black students in the study, and very marginal. Um, black students attended, and, and I'll tell you what I think this is actually saying, black students attending the majority minority schools showed higher levels of cultural flexibility than their peers attending majority white schools. For me, this made me pause, because if the process of integration was really working, I would have predicted the, the, the reverse. We also found that white students in North Capital City reported higher levels of cultural flexibility than white students in South Capital City. So the region, location was significant. Students in AP honors courses reported higher levels of cultural flexibility. Other significant factors showed that those students who had more, more homophilic preferences for their own social groups reported lower levels of cultural flexibility. And only for black students did we see that self-esteem was a significant predictor of their cultural flexibility. And, and in fact, students in the majority minority schools showed, proved, proved, um, showed higher levels of self-esteem than their peers in the desegregated predominantly white schools. And that's consistent with what other studies have shown. I'll talk to you more about why I think that is. So let's go to the ethnography, because that's what I enjoy and that's really what I do um, the most. One of the main findings for us in trying to unpack these data and try to understand these was that students were learning their places, their boundaries, their lines from the very real and symbolic distinctions they saw mirrored in their schools from the adults in those schools. Here's a quote from 11th grade Ashley. And she says, we have like kind of blurry lines a lot of the times. You have that group and you can't really like relate to that group. You can individually but like not as a whole group, pause here. She's speaking to the fact, you know, you can have that one friend who's different, but like you can't relate to the whole group. You know, we all have one friend maybe sometimes. And then, but a lot of the other groups just like, they've learned their lines a lot. Like we have a lot of people that are in AP classes and they hang out together a lot. And then there's the theater groups and stuff like that and they hang out. So she's already suggesting, verifying what we found in the data, that there are these different lines that can also be, uh, that can occur based on where you're positioned in the school. Similarly, a group of African American girls at Ashley School, this is South County Prep. So would you say that it's easier or difficult to become friends with someone from another background? And Angela says, well, it depends on the type of person. Tasha, like if you're easygoing and can really decide to really get into anything, stuff like that, it's not going to be hard. But if you like have totally different, you come from like totally different background, then it's going to probably be a little different, a little hard to get into. So the interviewer says, well, what group are y'all? Sherry says, the black people, yeah. Tasha says, so we just all hang out together. That's how it is. We just all hang out together. The reason why I want to bring up this school is, is this is the group of, this is these groups of students here at South County High on average score at the lowest on the cultural flexibility scale. This group of African American students also on average showed the lowest levels of uh, cultural, uh, of, 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 of self-esteem. They're very different, and I'll tell you about the organizational uh, processes in those schools and we, we saw in terms of the ethos that facilitated that kind of self-selection checking out and not being able to move more easily across the quote lines that Ashley talked about. 
But let me move across the Atlantic, because I want to show you similarly what happened in South Africa. Palmer High School, I'm talking to a group of kids in an interview, and John, a white 12th grade male, is trying to tell me what he thinks integration is. And it's not just about coming together to the same school. It's not just about demographic change. I mean, we've still got our own racial groups that you're speaking to. I think integration is actually seeing groups of separate people, races together, regardless of their race, whereas individuals together for things you have in common besides the race, besides the gender, your likes and dislikes, interests and hobbies. So I think integration is part of more than saying the segregation is over. People have to get together and be willing to be together, more comfortable with each other. And so I ask, well, can you see segregation within an integrated school? Yes, definitely. How? What are the levels? I think in sports teams, actually. I think races generally are sticking to separate sports. If you look at hockey, I think people playing hockey are white. And netball, Jean, a colored girl, comes in. Netball is mostly played by those who are colored. And Amanda comes in. She's a white 12th grade female. That's one of the reasons I didn't play netball, because I thought I was going to be the only white person in the team. It was back in grade eight. The reason I bring this up to you is because here are some of these processes within schools that we actually don't think about the patterns that can reproduce the, the kinds of engagement that we have. When I was at South County High, baseball was to white boys as basketball was to black boys, cheerleading was to white girls as stepping was to black girls. Here, netball was to colored as hockey was to white as soccer was to African or black, as field hockey was to white. And so we saw all of these ways in which the social landscape of the school was quite racialized through activities that were supposed to be representative of the school. Palmer High School um, is a school, however, that actually started to work on trying to diminish those lines. And let me tell you about that in a moment. But from these data, there are two, there's one general, there was one main kind of cross-national finding. In the US, the lines were more apparent in the classrooms through tracking and through the extracurricular spaces. In South Africa, the lines were con concretized through specific culturally based codes and policies, even though we saw some evidence through extracurriculars. And one of the reasons I would suggest to you is because they didn't have the tracking, so the kids had to be in the classroom together, but that did not diminish the kinds of social interactions and some of the boundaries that we saw outside of the classroom. So my team and I would always have to make decisions where we were going to sit or be so as not, and it had to be strategic, so as not to signify that we had allegiance to one group or the other. Here's another symbolic boundary. In the South African context, language. Language was a symbolic boundary, and it's very interesting in the country with 11 national languages, why none of its so-called good schools were teaching any of the nine African languages. The preservers of language in South Africa were the township schools who had very poor material resource context. We would walk into schools, I could not find chalk to write on the board, I could barely find toilet paper. The teachers had a hard time having enough books for their kids, but these schools were trying to do enough they can as, as they could with the limited resources, but they had very different cultural processes going on. In the township school, as Principal Jonah in Como at Mont Johnny Secondary School says, our policy states that we're using English. They were all English media schools, the ones I studied. But there is also this period that we will always be dedicated to our mother tongue. And therefore, we shall take English as a second language and our mother tongue as a first language. And that's how we do differ as a policy from Williston, which was the other school in the study. At Williston, they would say our medium of language is English, and our first language is English, and our second language is Afrikaans. The reason why this was so significant, for those of you who know any South African history, in 1976, the Soweto student uprisings were a big deal because students were protesting, African students, their overthrow of being made to take their exams in Afrikaans, the language of their oppressors, Right? And in 1976, the iconic photo of 15-year-old Hector Peterson being carried, his lifeless body, in the arms of a classmate because they were walking peacefully to protest the language policies of an apartheid state. 
And language has continued to remain a very strong political and symbolic boundary that divides. But what's really striking is that in the new democratic dispensation, they say, in South Africa, we don't see any of these African languages being taught in the so-called better schools. English and Afrikaans remain the dominant languages, and they become problematic in those contexts. Here's one I didn't find, I didn't anticipate, and I was not looking for, and you might think it's quite frivolous, but it's also one that has quite political, uh, great political signification in the South African context, and that was hairstyles. When I first arrived in South Africa in 2001, a group of African girls came up to me after I was talking to Sipo and his friends, and they said, can we speak with you? And I said, sure, why? And they said, um, we want to talk to you because We've been trying for many months to get the school to allow our, our, uh, us to wear hair like yours. And I said, oh, really? And I said, well, why can't you? And they said, because the school governing body says that we can't. And I said, but why? And I'm like, one well, trying to understand. We don't know. We can't get that passed. Even the student representatives couldn't get it passed. So when I go back in 2004, three years later, fast forward, I'm interviewing and I'm there every day and it comes up again. And I was like, well, I guess I have to explore this as an ethnographer, the hair issue. I'm talking to Principal Karen Billups and this is what she says to me. Hair must be neat and tidy. It can't be too long, no fancy hairstyles and that's about all. We don't allow dyed and colored hair, dreadlocks, braiding and all those things. Those are regarded as fancy high hairstyles. So I ask her, well, why is that fancy? Well, because it's just not normal. And short, back and sides, they, some social boundary, must keep it neat. I mean, if you look at them, they kind of have varying in that. So they keep it really short if they want to. So you can imagine how hard it was for me as a researcher to be sitting in a room being told that I was not normal, but I did. I did it, right? And so I'm, I'm, this, this was a really big issue for kids because I had learned in my first body of research that for children, for adolescents, how they look, the differentiations they use with their hair, their clothing, their interaction styles, these things are really important in their day-to-day -day interactions with each other. So now go three hours south to Palmer High School and I'm talking with the principal there and Principal John Dalton, he further elaborates to me why this is a contentious issue. The question of hair. It's always a contentious issue, this question of hair, and what's quite interesting, particularly with open schools, meaning the desegregated schools, is that black people have curly hair. Now in the Tulsa tradition, your traditional Tulsa boy should have his hair cut as short as possible. That's a sign of respect. But if a white boy cuts his hair short, it's a sign of being a punk. So now he's making a statement, whereas the Tulsa boy is not. So it's almost as though you've got different rules for blacks and whites, which, create, which creates a few problems, I should say. Then there's the question of braiding. Now, it used to be only that, that only females braided their hair. But now the boys think it's cool to braid their hair. And this school is one of the few schools that allow the boys to braid their hair. It looks neat as long as it's neat and tidy not sort of Bob Marley's sort of style. It's got to be neat and tidy. There was this whole thing about neat and tidy. So I said, well, white kids can't wear the braids? White kids, no, which is very strange. Our rule says that if your hair supports the braid on its own, then you can have braids. So we don't allow that because then you've got this kind of Christmas tree effect, end of quote. So here is the drawing on a kind of phenotypic biological notion of race. And also, in some ways, trying to be culturally sensitive, if you will. But the, 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 what was happening at Palmer at that time was the fear that the cultural styles around hair would actually diffuse and that white youth would want to emulate those styles. And so, in or, and you see, this is, this is the power of assimilation in some ways. It was okay for cultural assimilation to happen in one direction, but there was a struggle in this school for it to be bi-directional. And this school made a policy based on phenotype, and they had a very, as I said, weird rule. I mean, it's actually quite, quite silly rule that if you couldn't hold it, the pencil test, if it couldn't hold a pencil when it curled itself, then you couldn't wear your hair. So this is how they reproduced the notion of who was different culturally, who was in and who was out. Now, unlike Williston, which had an absolute zero tolerance policy, 
they actually in the beginning tried to be more culturally sensitive for closer kids. But get, this is what happens. Fast forward four years later, 2008, this was in 2004, I'm back there interviewing Principal John Dalton and it comes up again, so this is now at seven years we're still talking about hair, and Principal Dalton says to me, Prudence, guess what, we changed that policy. And I said, well, what are you doing now? Now all the kids can do whatever they want. You know, we had a Scandinavian graduate student to come in to do her master's thesis. And she wrote about this. And she helped us to figure out why this was kind of unequal and why this was problematic. And I'm smiling because I'm like, well, I saw this four years prior, and why didn't I say anything? So let me be fully reflexive at this moment. In 2004, when I was there, I went in with my elite graduate methodological training where I was told that you don't disrupt the natural setting of an environment. I also went in as an African-American woman in a white dominant space and was not confident that whatever I said was actually going to be heard well by the, the teaching staff and the administration. But be empowered students that you actually can have an impact because the Scandinavian graduate student came in, found the same thing, and the policy did change. Dalton and his team now have become some of the most vigilant about the kind of softer, kind of intangible processes that can happen in the schools that can render some kids in and other kids out. What I also found in this study is that how to be socially inclusive really varied across these eight schools, but more specifically across the four schools that were really working at including historically disadvantaged kids. At South County High, which I talked about Ashley and, and, and Tasha and the girls earlier, race and achievement differences were so fundamentally strongly correlated. This was a school with the lowest cultural flexibility for black students, the lowest self-esteem, out of 292 African-American students, I could get teachers and students only to name two to three high-achieving kids. Overall, a third of the African-American students were being suspended or expelled compared to 11% of the students. There was no attention to these processes and dynamics going on in the school. It was just acquiesce, well, they're here, we just let it play out. We don't attend to the structured nature of what's going on. Similarly, Williston High School, no attention to how they were creating the ins or the outs, the thems and the, the in groups and the out groups. They also had very strong racialized discipline processes. In 2008, when we were back there, I saw, observed with my, uh, my uh, research assistant at a time, African boys and girls locked behind gates when they were naughty reminiscent of something that I saw in Robben Island when Nelson Mandela spent 19 years in a very small uh, cell. They called this at the school, the jail. This was a school that was very, very colorblind in its approach to how it treated its students. It thought it was being colorblind, but actually it was being very, very racial and ethno-racial in, in its orientation. Compare and contrast that in the United States. North Village High School, which is Judah's school. Now there was some attention to e equality and trying to create an equal, equal opportunity context for these kids who were being bussed in, but there was limited insight into how their, the structured nature of race and class happened in this school. One of the ways in which they tried to pay some attention um, to it was by having what I call what they call the achievement gap initiative and I would sit in on these meetings because they were really worried about how kids who were black and brown in the school were doing in the school but at the same time when we would when we looked at those kids four years later even though they were in a resource rich school only five of about a hundred of those kids were on their way to college compared to 95 plus percent of the Asian and white kids who attended that school. The first day we attended my RA, Megan and I went to this school, it was all a buzz because about a about, um, hundred of the students were on their way to a 10-day exchange program in the VD, uh, to, to, to Japan. None of the VDP students would go to Japan or Austria or Paris or Latin America. These are places where presumably one's <laughs> cultural flexibility and horizons could be broadened. These students, however, weren't participating in those things because the boundaries had been, had been created about who was in. The orchestra wasn't for the VDP kids. I remember one day walking into the school and I would randomly select which classes I would sit in on a day. And there was a course on gender in ancient Rome. 
I thought, well, that's interesting. High school, gender in ancient Rome. Let me go to sit in on this class. And I said to the VDP director that day, I'm going to Mr. Brat, uh, I, forget, I think I call him Mr. Britton in the book. I'm going to his class. And she was like, what's this class? Who is that? And I said, well, he teaches this course on gender in ancient Rome. Oh, our kids don't do nothing like that. That's how she said it to me. There was a boundary automatically put up about what the VDP kids could do, what kinds of classes they would take, and what they couldn't take. These kids at North Village Prep, a very, the most affluent school in my study, also showed, reported some of the lowest levels of cultural flexibility. That was problematic for me, particularly given how rich rich, literally, the school was. And we found significant differences also in the extent to which the kids were being uh, suspended and expelled in the schools. Compare and contrast that to a schools that were more radically egalitarian. Places like Palmer, which was trying to do it by paying some attention to the pre and post apartheid uh, 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 um, uh, struggles. This was a school when I first started going um, had about, yeah, I'd say about, about 100 kids they sent off on a retreat. By the time we finished the research in 2008, that program had increased, and they call it the diversity trippers, where they would send kids from around the school off on a weekend retreat to really grapple with their differences, to really grapple in the most vulnerable ways. When we actually surveyed the school on the cultural flexibility scale, they, among all the students in the study, reported the highest on the cultural flexibility scale. So, and here are some of the things that we found from being, from being uh, <laughs> participants in those things. Ashton is a kid who says, well, when I went into the camp, I heard like, you know, the whole camp was about racism, you know, the whole diversity tripper camp and judging and stuff. And then when I went away from the camp, it was a real eye opener because I didn't realize that I judged people for so little things. And it just becomes a part of you that you can't really get away from, you know, the judging and stuff. So Danielle, she's sitting there talking with Claire. She says, well, me and Claire are having a conversation. And before we would have made a, com a comment about Penny because she's black. And then camp happens, and then I get back to school, and Claire makes a comment, and I'm supposed to laugh with her. But instead I say, no, don't say that. She was very confused. They, because Claire wasn't in the diversity troopers, they don't know how to deal with it. So I said, well, can you say anything, or do you just keep quiet? And Danielle says, well, instead of saying you're wrong, because then you're actually degrading them, you say, well, I think that, or I don't see it like that. And then Alice comes in, and hopefully it will rub off on them instead of telling them what to do and say how you're familiar. And they'll go, oh, my word, maybe she's right. So, so they're grappling with these issues in Palmer High School. And this is a school that really, in the course of four years, as they were being vigilant and attentive to all the different processes, who was represented in what. You could walk down the halls, who were in the theater activities, very multiracial, very, very much reflective of the, of the different social groups who were in the school. In the U.S. context, where this hap was happening, this active social and cultural boundary permeation, were in the majority minority schools. And so one of the things to understand, you remember the result, that the black students in the majority minority schools were showing higher levels of cultural flexibility. And what I argue is because they were having radically different educational experiences than the kids who were in the majority white schools. At North City Tech, Cherise, a ninth grade African American girl who talks very explicitly, I tell these stories in the book, taking Chinese classes because her best friends are Asian. Anthony, who was a boy who had come from a parochial school where they used the term Oriental to refer to Asians, was now talking about how his horizons had broadened because of all that was going on in this school. There were different ethnic and cultural groups and performances, and they were conscious and active about the differences, but at the same time, they weren't separate. They supported each other's activities. The librarians, the teachers had active and visual representation of all the different kinds of things that were going on in the lives of schools of students politically, historically, economically, all around the walls. So you knew that it was a really vibrant, ethnic, uh, ethnically diverse and racially diverse student. These students at this school scored on average, these two schools the highest on the cultural flexibility scales. Similarly, in South City Honors, which was in the South Capital City, Adam talking about his kind of interracial romances, actually doing the same thing. These kids saw representation of different kinds of kids in Model UN, orchestra, chorus, soccer. 
the things that presumably could be conduits to broadening the hor cultural horizons of all students, and they didn't just look like one particular group. That's the story. That Those were the kinds of things we saw actively happening in the schools. Similarly, in their classrooms, very diverse classrooms working together collaboratively, racially mixed, fairly balanced. In AP classes, it wasn't uncommon to see black students with white students working in these classes. So we were seeing all of these kinds of very different educational contexts going on depending on the schools. So let me just kind of wrap up about the findings. In the U.S.-South African comparison, nationally there are different ideological approaches, I argue, to equity and inclusion. And in South Africa, as I remind you, there is a notion of radical inclusion comp compared to what we call symbolic multiculturalism in the U.S. But I still saw some convergence in the schools on the ground in micro-level interactions in these schools despite the differences in some of the schools, in the policy context. And I argue that the reproduction of social boundaries persists in schools with little attention to the lines that can be produced by racialized tracking, racialized extracurricular activities, as well as exclusionary and symbolically violent messages that can be inherent in policies and codes. I also argue that schools that have transformed normatively, John Powell, the legal scholar, says that integration is really about normative change. It's not just about demographic change, that's desegregation. But integration is about bringing people to the center, as Lois Weiss and Michelle Fine talk about. And those schools that transform themselves normatively in how they do diversity, that moved away from either a colorblind or a cultural difference approach, they appear to be the most successful with incorporating their different groups of students. And so why, I argue, do we need to pay attention to the soft structures of schooling? I, I sincerely believe, and many sociologists of education, this is what predominates in our subfield today. We do a lot, we've created a cottage industry, I'm trying to explain the achievement gaps, the racialized test score gaps. And I'm arguing here that we have to remember that education and schooling are not just about those achievement outcomes. True enough, access to strong material resources as a focus is absolutely necessary, but it's not sufficient for the overall educational well-being of students. Intangible, hard to measure socio-cultural and political dynamics, resources within the schools, like the ones I'm talking about here in this study, are likely to have some impact on engagement, which could consequently have some impact on how well students have uh, do in schools. I don't do test score analysis, so I can't say that I'm suggesting that. I'm also arguing that the social and symbolic boundaries within some schools will influence the movement. What we did here in this study is students like they will go into spaces where they see people like them, the peer effect in some ways. But if they're going to be isolated, very few of them will participate in those kinds of activities. And so the nature and the substance of status dynamics and intergroup relations in schools really, I suggest, would have a long-term social, civic, and economic consequence if we don't pay attention to some of these soft structures. It also brings me back to the third focus that Lavery talked about. If we can't diminish the social distance through education, which is one of the most dominant social institutions in our society, then we're going to reproduce those on every level post-schooling. Throughout, through the workplace, through neighborhood formations, through our civic engagement patterns, et cetera. And there are tons of people who have written about some of those things. So I'm going to end where I began, going back to my sage 15-year-old Judah. And he said, and I quote, this was he said to my um, RA, Megan, if we want to reduce the achievement gap, we must also eradicate the empathy gap. And I'm going to add on that. For students to be culturally and academically flexible and deeply incorporated and engaged, educators in good schools should be flexible too. I want to acknowledge the people who've really supported this work and thank them. And I want to thank you for listening. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University. This program is brought to you by Emory University.